30 years ago this week, the life of one of Britain's foremost writers, Salman Rushdie, was to change forever. His novel, The Satanic Verses, inspired Iran's spiritual leader, Ruhollah Khomeini, to issue a fatwa, a death warrant. He declared the book blasphemous. The strength of feeling about Rushdie's book resulted in death threats to the author almost as soon as Satanic Verses came out. The call to arms triggered mass protests from London to Islamabad and closed down the space for debate around Islam in a way many would say still resonates today. Rushdie embarked on a life of high security and was often in hiding. He survived the fatwa. Others did not. Protesters attacked the cultural centre in Islamabad. Six people were killed in clashes with police. Translators of the novel were attacked. One died. The dangers he faces have been graphically illustrated by attacks on translators of his novel, this at a press conference last year, and by the murder of the Japanese translator just four months ago. The political climate of the time proves critical to understand the context. Despite the apparent chaos, a pattern is gradually emerging. The Ayatollah's supporters are now fully armed. The Iranian revolution was just a decade old, and the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse after being driven out of Afghanistan by the US-backed Mujahideen. Rushdie's novel and the fatwa that followed were described at the time as a dam breaking. The response from the West was a confused affair. Whilst the New York Times was one of the few voices to unambiguously declare murder is no form of literary criticism, John le Carre called Rushdie arrogant and accused him of self canonization Rushdie himself always stood by the book. When, when we are in a situation in which a book is, is under an anti-democratic censoring attack. We can't afford to let them win. So what is the legacy of the Rushdie fatwa? Joining me now, Farzana Sheikh, Associate Fellow at Chatham House, Peter Tatchell, the human rights campaigner, and Geoffrey Robertson, Salman Rushdie's lawyer at the time. And am I right in thinking, uh, Geoffrey, the man who took him into hiding when the fatwa was He announced? stayed in our attic a few times in Islington. It was a strange time in uh, you would get a knock on the door the special branch would come in Salman is coming to dinner they'd go upstairs and stake out the place look at the church opposite um, it was curious it, it was unsettling and unnerving obviously because this was state terrorism this was uh, we'd all dealt with the IRA before they were easy but this was uh, a powerful state offering a three million pound bounty Did for the execution. Him? Well, there were attempts and uh, he needed to be fully uh, supported by uh, police and by the government. I'm pleased mm. to say Mrs. Thatcher, who he described as Mrs. Torture in the um, satanic verses was uh, supportive as of course was was Neil Kinnock and uh, Michael Foote so I think that in the end the extraordinary thing was that no one seemed to have read the book <laughs> because it wasn't necessary to threaten you, well they were Selman you Rushdie. were following orders I guess that was the point weren't you you were following the orders they were leader. brainwashed into barbarity and in, in wanting to kill let me bring Selman in, in Fazana Sheikh uh, I wonder whether you think this was the moment uh, in which sort of hardcore fundamentalist um, Islam became sort of seen as the voice of Islam in the world. I mean, that, that was what it felt like at that time. It may have felt like that at the time, but um, in fact, the, the Islamic world is hugely diverse. And I think what this did uh, in, in many ways was really to obscure that diversity. And that left many people thinking uh, that uh, the Islamic world, such as it was, spoke with a single voice. And I think one of the most catastrophic consequences of the Rushdie affair was precisely to, 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 to crush dissent uh, inside uh, the Muslim world and whatever liberal currents run through this Muslim world uh, were, were on the back foot and, and on the defensive. Could, could there have been a moment then um, for moderate majority Muslims uh, 
to be able to take on that fatwa? Could there have been a, a, a response that we just didn't hear? It would have been difficult, uh, quite frankly, uh, given the circumstances at the time, given the very, very uh, heated passions that were aroused uh, by the affair. But of course, much water has since uh, passed under the bridge. And there have been moves now for moderate voices uh, in the Muslim world uh, to, to, to come but together the again. Crown prince there of is Saudi still Arabia I'm actually sorry, kills sorry, a journalist. It is sorry, very sorry, similar. Well, yes. I mean, of course, Saudi Arabia is uh, is is you know, in some senses, uh, a, a case apart. I mean, uh, it doesn't speak for the Muslim world, which, as I've just said, is hugely diverse. I mean, the Saudi Arabian voice uh, is, uh, is uh, a loud and prominent voice uh, for reasons, really, which have very little to do with, um, with, with Islamic concerns as such. They are much more But it's still state terrorism by, uh, attacking a writer. Just a second. Um, P Peter, if I can just bring you in. Um, it, it did sort of sh seem to shut down debate about Islam at the time. You will remember the response of many Western writers, liberals, intellectuals, who had this strange response to the Rushdie affair, which was, yes, it's terrible, but... But he's wrong. He shouldn't have published. But he shouldn't have published, <laughs> yeah, or he said yeah. some bad things, or he crossed a line. Yeah. It was may maybe never explicitly spelled out, but that was the sort of understanding, was that somehow he'd brought it on himself. Yes, it was a great failure of liberalism. And I think that the failure of liberals to speak out opened the void for the far right. The far right was able to step in because liberal and left opinion was often silent about the right of a writer to write what he wishes and to not be subjected to a threat, an order of death. Um, there were, of course, liberal Muslims who did speak out. So South or Black Sisters, many of whose members come of, from Muslim heritage, was one of the most vocal critics of the fatwa and in defense, not of all the ideas in the Sanic verses, but the right of a writer to publish. And then, of course, there was the great British Muslim scholar, Zaki Badawi, um, who said very clearly, um, Muslims should just spurn this book, or at least criticize it, but not kill Rushdie. Mm. And his, his was a very isolated voice. But there were some Muslim people who said, death is not the answer. Death is not the right response. Death is, it, murder is not a form of literary criticism, yeah. but it was the New York yeah. Times. But this idea that because something was 30 years ago, it now seems very clearly to be wrong, um, we should take with a pinch of salt. I mean, if you look what happened five years ago with the Charlie Hebdo cases, you still had that. You've had it with the Danish cartoons. You still have this sense of something that might be offensive. Yeah, I, I doubt very much that a book like The Satanic Verses could be published today out of fear by publishers and writers. And that is a shocking indictment of our liberal democratic society. But it society. is published and it is read at last yeah. because people didn't read it then. They, but of course, I'm trying to say that the crown prince of Saudi Arabia is, as head of, virtually head of state, doing exactly what the Ayatollah did in eliminating a writer for freedom of speech, for you mean criticism. With the Khashoggi? Yes, with the Khashoggi killing. I, so, and also, we need to we... remember that Salman Rushdie is not really safe today, even, because only three years ago, the Iranians upped the bounty on his head, promising to pay over $3 million well, that's, to that's, anyone that's... who kills him today. Faisal. That's absolutely right, Jeffrey. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, we mustn't forget that uh, if the Saudi crown prince has acted with, with uh, impunity, as it appears uh, 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 he has, he has done so uh, with, with the complicity of powerful Western backing. So, you know, as I said, I don't think uh, that he should really be seen as someone who has the concerns uh, of, of, uh, of, 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 the, of the Islamic community, the global Islamic community at heart. He is a man who is dr primarily driven by the interests of the Saudi state yes, and by his powerful own power. um, economic interests underpinning yeah. that state. Uh, and, you know, these are really quite distinct 
um, uh, distinct things all, to, all together. So what, what do you think was the, the legacy then of that, that failure to call it out? I mean, do you think, you know, would you go so far as to say we repeated it again over the, the Rotherham um, grooming of, of young women, uh, girls, it, well, actually? It, it's, it's the same basic issue. When liberal and left voices do not speak out against extremism and intolerance, it leaves the field open to the far right. Mostly and the far liberal. right is exploiting that void. And I blame a lot of this on liberal and left opinion. Their silence gives the platform to the far right to make unjustified, generalised attacks upon all Muslim people. Come on, Peter. My recollection is that liberals did by and large, support Salman. I remember Guttegrass came over, Tom Stoppard. Yeah, yeah. We all spoke out. And uh, I don't think the problem was liberals. The problem was the far right, as you say. Uh, it was the business community who tried to get the government to continue relations with Iran, rather than as Donald Trump continues relations with mm. Saudi at the moment. And to the virtue of the government. They refused, Mrs Thatcher refused to uh, do that. And so uh, Britain took a principled stand 30 years ago, which Donald Trump and Britain today is not taking. So we've gone backwards then? Yeah, I, I think, think so. Right. In terms of the you I have to stand up to state Sorry, terrorism just bring by next. punishing that state. Second. I, I think I think what, what is I think what matters here is context. Context matters, uh, and you know I mean if you take a country like uh, like Pakistan or, or or some other countries uh, in the Muslim world, I mean fear is a very powerful factor constraining uh, the liberal voice. Certainly in Pakistan, where acts of blasphemy entail the yeah. death sentence, there are many people, even amongst liberals, who feel afraid to well, speak out. Exactly, it doesn't have to be in Pakistan. Really, uh, ignore that. Well, I, the I Pakistan think it was had, law is based. On on the British uh, Hanif Qureshi, well, who precisely is a, so, uh, yeah. as we know, in the United Kingdom as well. Hanif Qureshi, who's a good uh, friend of Sam Rushdie, said no one would have the balls to write satanic verses today. Do you think that's right? Absolutely. Absolutely. They would fear the consequences. You know, two of the translators of the satanic verses were stabbed. One of them died. One was murdered. And I think that chilling factor is encouraging a self-censorship. And we've seen it over the Danish cartoons and Charlie Hebdo. Again, I think perhaps more so, many liberals sort of said this was, a, this was a step too far, that we should constrain ourselves. But, you know, some of the greatest ideas in but history I, have caused great offence. Galileo Galilei, uh, Charles say. Darwin, Sigmund Freud. Where would we be without challenging, Bravery. provocative ideas? And I believe that every idea, including my own, should be subjected to scrutiny, criticism and ridicule. Yeah. Last word, Faisana. Well, can I can I just say that uh, of course I, I agree with Jeffrey that you know there one of one of the big consequences of the Rusty affair has been this climate of, of self censorship. But I think it's important to bear in mind that this no longer necessarily just pertains to to Muslims or or affairs dealing with Islam. It's right across the board. It affects uh, you know what we say about gender, about sexuality, about race, about class. Uh, there is self-censorship going on uh, about a whole range of different subjects, not just about Islam and matters of blasphemy. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.